We're going through something absolutely historic. Technologies across the board are growing exponentially. It's a disruption that's going to completely redefine the way businesses compete. In the next decade, we're going to lose 40% of today's Fortune 500 companies. The exponential growth of computing is continuing. AI is nowhere near its full potential. Whether you like it or not, that the future cannot be stopped by anyone. Hi there, everybody. This is uh, Mark Verbenkov, and welcome to the Future Tech and Foresight podcast. This is going to be episode number 136. Starting to get up there in the numbers, which is great. Um, so today's going to be a little bit of a different episode compared to uh, previous ones. Um, I've tended to steer away or veer away from episodes and concepts that are a little bit less certain um less kind of out there i think some of the the earlier ones in this new reformatting of the podcast like the uh, animal human hybrids or I mean, lots of neurotechnology ones might sound like they're a little bit out there if you will but they are uh pretty well vetted and the technologies and the impacts are pretty well substantiated but um today's episode is not going to be like that there's of course going to be uh, a lot of papers and um, good sources, which I'll obviously and always have in the show notes for you if you want to double check what I'm saying. But the conclusions of today's episode are going to be speculative. And I have tried to stay away from that as much as possible on the podcast um, for obvious and relevant reasons. But as is the case when you're looking at uh, future technologies and emerging technologies, you definitely come across some of the, shall we say, more peripheral and maybe even weird um, ideas out there. Uh, and I do try to parse those out as much as possible, but they are interesting and I definitely come across them. Um, and I thought it would be a good idea to share at least one episode, see what kind of feedback there is on it. Um, I already have a little list of other kind of, shall we say, off the beaten track type ideas. So if this is something that is uh, of interest, I can have other guests on and maybe even have the occasional um, or more occasional episode that touches on these sorts of um, esoteric type of ideas. It's not too esoteric, it's still maybe within the trend line, but you know, as you're connecting dots, there might be one dot that you're connecting a little bit outside of the usual, and I think that this, this episode kind of falls in line. So with that kind of preamble out of the way, um, take everything, take the conclusions with a grain of salt. Uh, from today's episode, uh, but let's get into it. So we're going to be talking a little bit about neurotech in general and potentially where it might be leading. So uh, neurotech has been brought up on the podcast a number of times. It's fascinating, right? For any of you that don't know, this is connected to Neuralink and the idea that we can connect our brains to technologies. Um, even just saying that sounds wild, even though I've had many guests on talking about this. Um, so I want to start off with a little bit of uh, giving you guys a little bit more context with kind of where we are with some of the more interesting things. I have a couple uh, sources, uh, just like one or two paragraphs per article that I think give a much better idea of what is capable right now. Um, so I'll be reading some of those and then diving as we go into the episode with the more and more esoteric or um, odd or kind of out there ideas. So. Uh, we can start off with rehashing the idea of uh, some of the neurotechnologies that are out there. Uh, I've had a couple of guests on talking about uh, invasive versus non-invasive neurotech. So the invasive would, of course, be the uh, Neuralink, where you're actually doing uh, surgery and implanting uh, a number of electrodes directly on to uh, the brain in order to get the brain data and the brain waves. Uh, which gives you the, the data of what's actually going on. The non-invasive type, which I'll be touching on in a little bit, um, is uh, more to do with like helmets and other type of gear that you can put onto your head. Um, so there's, for instance, uh, one of the more popular uh, examples of this that I think came out or, or was, was showcased uh, roughly last year is um, there's a, a girl, I guess she's uh, considered like a, one of these e-streamers, so streaming uh, video games. Um, she beat Elden Ring, which is a, uh, at least last year, was a very popular uh, and very difficult and challenging video game um, 
by controlling her character with her mind. So she had one of these helmets on. Uh, so she puts this helmet on, is able to uh, connect essentially the helmet, her mind, and the video game together. So if she's thinking uh, like push or pull, it activates the character on her screen to move in a certain way or attack a certain way. And she apparently beat this very challenging video game uh, without using a uh, controller. So it's all done with her mind. So that's kind of already possible today. Um, one of these other really interesting ideas is, uh, or example, sorry, is that um, through the use of artificial intelligence, we're now able to actually see the pictures uh, of what is going on in one's mind. So this is the first, uh, just, just a paragraph or two from an article that I want to read uh, because I think it's absolutely fascinating. So a team of researchers has shown that they're able to decode human brain scans to tell what a person is picturing in their mind according to a paper that was released in uh, November. Now, I don't know if this is uh, 2023 or 2022 or before, but uh, recently anyways. So their team, this is the team of researchers, um, made up from the National University of Singapore, uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong and Stanford, uh, did this by using brain scans of participants as they actually looked at more than a thousand pictures um, some of the examples are a red fire truck, a gray building, pretty standard and easy ones for uh, to train this AI. They did they were looking at these pictures while inside a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine or fMRI, which recorded the resulting brain signals over uh, a period of time. The researchers then sent those signals um, through to uh, an AI model to train it to associate certain brain patterns with certain images. Later, when the subjects were shown new images, again in the fMRI machine, the system detected the patient's brain waves, generated a shorthand description of what it thinks those brain waves correspond to, and used an AI image generator to produce a best guess facsimile of the image the participant saw. So this is really cool, obviously. Um, and the results uh, were pretty interesting. So an image of a house and a driveway resulted in a similarly colored bedroom and living room, still within the kind of realm of what the person is thinking. And uh, this is the last thing from the article that I'll read. The resulting generated images match the attributes. So this is the color, shape, etc., and the semantic uh, meaning of the original image roughly 84% of the time, which I think is pretty staggering. So take this, uh, I mean, you can read you can read the report, take it with a grain of salt if you wish, uh, but we're essentially at the point where we're, it's a little bit complicated, it's, it's not super simple to do, but we're at the point where technology is starting to be able to read and, their, and generate the images of what we have in our mind. Still relatively simple things, it's not to the level of dreams or other things that we have going on in our minds all the time, but we're, we're getting there. Another short section of an article that I want to read is um, it's about kernels. Uh, this, is a, this is a very well-known uh, technology company that has some similar caps and helmets that are able to read what's going on in our minds. And I think that this, it's just a short paragraph and a half, um, kind of describes better uh, as to how this technology works. So I'll go through this quickly. So one of the devices of Kernel called Flow, uh, it looks like a kind of high-tech uh, bike helmet, uh, but it has sensors, it has a ring of sensors inside when you flip it over, and the wire at the back can be connected to a computer system. So what this helmet does, this helmet measures changes in blood oxygenation levels. As parts of the brain activate and neurons fire, blood rushes in to provide oxygen. The blood also carries proteins in the form of hemoglobin, which absorbs infrared light differently when transporting oxygen. This is why veins are blue, but we bleed red. So flow takes advantage of this phenomenon by firing laser pulses into the brain and measuring the reflected photons to identify where a change in blood oxygenation has occurred. Critically, the device also measures how long the pulse takes to come back. The longer the trip, the deeper the photons have gone into the brain. 
Uh, it's a really nice way to distill out the photons that have gone into the brain versus ones that only hit the skull or scalp and bounced away. So there's another uh, helmet here. The other kernel helmet is called Flux. This measures electromagnetic activity as neurons fire and alter their electrical potential. Ions flow in and out of the cells. This process produces a magnetic field. Uh, if one that's uh, very weak and changes its behavior in milliseconds, making it extremely difficult to detect. So Kernel's technology can discover these fields all across the brain via tiny uh, magnetometers, which gives it another way to see what parts of the organ uh, lighting up, uh, what parts of the organ are lighting up during different activities. So the helmets not only are, are not only smaller than the devices they seek to replace, but they also have better bandwidth, making researchers um, uh, receive more data about the brain's function. So there's kind of like really interesting ways of measuring what's going on inside of our brains. And uh, this technology is, of course, only getting better over time. And there's more companies. I think one of the last guests I interviewed said something there's like 26, maybe uh, something under 30 companies that are doing similar things. And I think Kernel is one of the one of the leading ones. And then finally, within this kind of realm, uh, but more to the invasive technology, uh, Neuralink just a couple days ago had its first human trial. So this has been a thing that's been going on for a long time. They were trying to get uh, approval, I believe, from the FDA to have human testers to actually have their Neuralink uh, technology implanted. And the first one uh, apparently went successfully the last couple of days. And the patient, the subject, whatever we're calling them, uh, is, re is uh, resting and recuperating easily. That's kind of the context of, generally speaking, where we are with this technology. It's fascinating. Now, we're going to start moving into the realm of the weird here. Uh, I, w I definitely want to mention that we're moving um, out of the kind of ordinary kind of tried and true ideas that I really try to bring onto the podcast. I found an article from 2012, uh, which is DARPA's avatar project. Now I couldn't find any updates on this. They most likely dropped the project. I kind of hope that they did drop the project, but I wasn't able to find anything. If there's anybody uh, that listens to the episode, uh, and has some more updates on this, please let me know, uh, write a comment, uh, send me an email, and I'll try to have an addendum into the show notes at the very least. So what is DARPA's av avatar project? Essentially, what they're trying to do is something similar with, with these kinds of helmets. Uh, however, rather than just reading our minds a little bit, they're actually able or attempting, I shouldn't say able, they were hoping to be able to have soldiers mind control military hardware. So essentially creating um, robotic soldiers, but not in the same vicinity, not in the same facility or location. They were hoping to have this uh, several kilometers, you know, hundreds of thousands of kilometers away, kind of how like the uh, remote drone uh, military systems are, right? You have somebody in some um, uh, military facility controlling a drone that's bombing uh, certain targets overseas. So the same sort of thing was attempted, or at least uh, they had money to to uh, put towards it. I believe it was only some $7 million initially uh, in order to create these, for lack of a better term, uh, mind-controlled soldier robots um, that would then be able to you know, carry out the orders that uh, the soldiers were, were dictating. So that was one. Back in 2012, so it's already over a decade and haven't found anything since. So most likely abandoned. Um, if the state of the art of say like Neuralink, Kernel and these, and these other technologies are, are able to maybe control a character in a video game, but not much more. That being said, of course, uh, the military is always more advanced than civilian um, technology. But that's, that's uh, I, I guess, neither here nor there if I wasn't able to find any more. The next point here, uh, and again, this is still a couple of years old, is another avatar project uh, within the 2045 project, which is funded and pushed forward by a Russian billionaire by the name of Dmitry Itskov, if I'm not uh, butchering his last name. So you can check out at 2045.com. 
not a great website from from uh, what I'm thinking, but the idea there is to extend human life through a digital download, if you will, of somebody's mind into various different avatars. And kind of the ultimate one would be some sort of holographic version of yourself. You know, this is again sci-fi. This has been talked about in uh, popular shows like Black Mirror. I've touched on it on the podcast a couple times. It's definitely out there, but it's these ideas are starting to gain ground. If you know, we're starting to get more, uh, even just TV shows and Hollywood ideas proposing these uh, theories, and it's not just some uh, uh, eccentric you know, Russian billionaire trying to create a program to extend his life forever, or at least his consciousness by downloading uh, and then uploading into a robot or hologram. So again, a little bit of an out there idea. But um, you know, I wanted to bring specifically these two, two ideas up because I think it touches on the larger trend, uh, not just, you know, the Hollywood ideas, but there's also some, you know, potentially serious money going into the capabilities of reading human minds. So it's a trend line that this is clearly progressing on. We're at the early stage, early stages, um, but this seems to be uh, continuing. That's that part of the episode. The next part, um, which I think is relatively short as this is more or less just introducing the idea to the podcast and to all of you for the first time. This is where the speculation um, comes about. We're looking previously at reading minds. Well, how about sending information into the brain or into the mind? I heard, and this kind of sparked the entire podcast for today, I heard in a very wild other podcast uh, where a guy was speaking about essentially being able to do that, that there was already a study out there where there was some form of sending information wirelessly into into a subject's brain. I had uh, ChatGPT write up a summary of the of the study, so I'll just read that and uh, and then touch on a little bit of my ideas as to where this is going, and then kind of end the episode there. So, in the brain-to-brain -brain commu uh, communication experiment, two senders, so these are uh, human senders, connected to EEG devices and they made decisions in a Tetris-like game about whether to rotate a block. So it's a pretty simple experiment. So these decisions about whether to rotate a block or not were communicated to a single receiver subject, right? So these are two human senders, one human receiver. And the receiver could not see the game, but had a game controller to play the game. So the receiver wearing a transcranial magnetic stimulation cap tms cap received the sender's decisions as a flash of light in their peripheral vision so what happened is if uh, a light on one side of the receiver's peripheral vision uh, showed uh, or lit up it indicated to the to the receiver uh, to play the game based on the redecided instructions if there was if there was a light it meant rotate so the decision was see a light rotate the block no flash of light in the peripheral vision means do not rotate the receiver was able to play the game and able to rotate the block in order to fit it into the necessary place essentially win the game again it's not it's not tetris but it's a tetris like game so this innovative approach allowed the receiver to play the game based on the transmitted brain signals demonstrating a basic but significant form of brain-to-brain -brain communication. Of course, I'll have the um, technologyreview.com uh, article up on the show notes. Uh, if you just want to Google it right now, it's called The First Social Network of Brains. Three people transmit through, uh, thoughts to each other's heads. So that's pretty wild. What are my thoughts on this, which is the whole reason of this, of this entire podcast? I want to talk a little bit about the mediums, the mediums of idea sharing and specifically advertising. Uh, so I wrote a, I wrote a paper um, that enabled me to get into my master's program and it was about the new medium or the environment of autonomous vehicles and why Google back in, oh, I can't remember the exact uh, date, let's say 2012 or, or earlier, maybe it was even 2009, got into the autonomous vehicle space. And it made me think about, and my, my professor at the time, 
was pushing me is to think like, why would Google, uh, an ad based company focus so heavily and invest so much into the autonomous vehicle space? It didn't make sense at the time. Uh, but after some digging, um, what I discovered was, well, of course, they're going to be getting into this space. If there's an autonomous vehicle, it means that the driver, especially when you reach level four and level five autonomy, doesn't need to look at the traffic, right? They can just be working on their laptop or or interacting with uh, screens or interacting with other passengers. You don't need to be looking outside. So what does that offer? What does that um, evoke it, or what does that enable? And what it enables is an entire windshield of the vehicle and literally any um, uh, glass window in the vehicle can be turned into a screen that people can interact with. And if you're Google, that's an entire other environment or medium to showcase your ads. Because you can't really showcase ads when people are driving. That's about, uh, you know, generally in the Western world, that's about two hours every single day that people are not looking at their cell phones, not looking at advertisements. Uh, and it's a reduced time frame for Google to be generating revenue. Um, but I want to go back a little bit and not just talk about autonomous vehicles. But if we look at the entire history of idea sharing, we can first see, well, obviously it was it was uh, just around the campfire, word of mouth, but the external forms of sharing were books, uh, newspapers or prints, then we move into billboards, then radio, then TV, then computers, social media and the internet and the smartphone era. And I've been fortunate enough to have a couple guests on the podcast that made me realize that the entire VR and AR and I guess XR industry is when the metaverse takes off is very likely to become a very large ad focus and ad centered space for a lot of companies to put forward their ads or even in more subtle ways using some sort of AI avatars. Uh, you know, if you're walking down the streets of a, of a normal city in the metaverse, you can have a, a, a nice looking car that uh, maybe you might be interested in and there could be a ai generated digital avatar walking up to you and saying hey um what do you think about this car or more nefariously and more i guess you could say insidious and i think this was the example that my guest brought on um you could be walking down the street and two ai avatars in the metaverse right of course you have goggles on so it's in the metaverse they could be having a discussion and the dialogue between them could be um, set up in such a way that it would uh, motivate you or hook you or interest you in the car that they're talking about. So they're not talking to you, but because you're within earshot, um, they could be essentially manipulating you subtly to be interested in the car and the car could be a bright red or a bright green or something like that. So you notice it visually as well. So the XR space could be another entire new environment for advertisers to get their um, to get their products in front of you. Same thing with autonomous vehicles, which um, instilled this idea of new mediums and new environments for advertising space, but also ideas being shared and not necessarily good ones, right? If we're talking about the 2024 period being perhaps the most important year for elections uh, in the world ever. You know, if we're looking in the next five to 10 years, uh, it's not just going to be social media, but it's going to be autonomous vehicles. It's going to be uh, the metaverse. It's going to be all these kinds of different mediums where new ideas can be propagated into people's minds subtly um, without their knowing in order to nudge their behavior into specific ways that benefit, you know, whether it's political um, parties or, or corporations trying to sell their things. So that's the trend line um, as I and others see it. And the point of this entire episode is to bring about the idea that if this neurotechnology is starting to enable, or it's at the very initial phases of transmitting information into people's minds rather than just um, understanding what's going on in somebody's mind, uh, and then giving that information to a researcher or to the person themselves, if you can actually send information into people's minds, 
the next logical step, right? If we're connecting dots, the next step here is to directly beam in one form or another advertisements or the sharing of different propaganda or political ideas directly into people's minds once this technology um, becomes a little bit more advanced. So that's the uh, that's the idea of this podcast. That's um, that's the whole reason that I wanted to discuss all of this. I don't necessarily know what to think about it. I would very much like to have a guest who has thought about this deeply uh, come onto the podcast and share their ideas on this. But if this idea is true, if it does hold some weight, it's um, well, one, it's a fascinating future to think about, and simultaneously, it's a terrifying future to think about. So uh, with that, I think I'm going to end the episode and let you, dear listener, um, dear audience member, think about this as well. Um, it's, uh, it's a very interesting future that we're moving into. So I hope that you got some value from, from these ideas and uh, are hopefully maybe even shaking your head as to the future that we're moving into. Um, I will definitely try to get a guest on that has thought about this a little bit deeper and uh, give us some new ideas to... to reconcile or maybe give a bit of a better framework for how to think about these sorts of things. Thanks for listening. Well, thanks for listening to this week's Future Tech and Foresight podcast. If you like what you've heard here, there are, of course, a number of ways that you can support the podcast. The best way would be to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or give a rating on Spotify, which you can find a step-by-step explanation for on the futuretechandforesight.com website. Alternatively, feel free to leave a comment either on the episode show notes or the YouTube channel where you can see video recordings of the interviews. And finally, if you are part of an organization that is aware of the disruptive and transformational impact that emerging and future technologies will bring and want to know more, please get in touch to hear about the strategic foresight services that we offer and how we can help future-proof your organization and take advantage of the phenomenal opportunities available to survive and thrive in the future. A lot of future shock people and future shock institutions in our society are simply overwhelmed. Once there is superintelligence, the fate of humanity may depend on what the superintelligence does. Science fact is catching up to science fiction. The first truly intelligent machine will be the last invention that humanity needs to make. The only scarcity that will exist in the future is that which we decide to create ourselves as humans. Within a 10 year design revolution, we can have all humanity living the highest and living anybody's ever known. Progress is uh, accelerating at an exponential pace and it's gonna reach a point where progress is so fast it's going to be a singularity. We are probably one of the last generations of homo sapiens. Every single headline points to the birth pangs of a type 1 civilization.